Good morning. Welcome. You made it. You braved the rain here in Southwest Florida. You came, even though there's something going on this evening, not sure what it is. <laughs> I don't care about it. You're going to come to the 6 o'clock service tonight? <laughs> there is no 6 o'clock service. Maybe we should make one on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> if you're new... <laughs> Do not. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And if you are new here in town, and you've been here for a little while, you may have discovered something. That if you want to go out at prime time, like dinner time, to a really nice restaurant or a popular restaurant, you should probably get a reservation. It's kind of important. A lot of our favorite places, kind of a love-hate relationship that we have with season, a lot of our favorite places we can't always get in. So you got to make a reservation. And on that point, I heard a story about a spoiled girl. Not really a girl, a young lady. They're girls as you get old like me. She was in her mid-20s. Those are kids. <laughs> kind of spoiled. And she had a group of cronies that followed her around everywhere, just telling her everything she wants to hear. So she kept them around. Her parents were wealthy, so she used daddy's credit card a lot. She liked to show off. They decided to go out to a nice restaurant, prime time. She gets to the host podium or desk or whatever, and he asks the question, do you have a reservation? They ask that for a reason, by the way. She says, no, I don't. Well, I'm sorry, we're booked. Now, here's the thing. You may have done this, so don't feel too bad, but don't be that girl, because here's what she does. She points out the obvious fact that there are a couple of empty tables. Have you ever been that girl or that guy? Hey, but I noticed, I know you're booked, I noticed there's a couple empty tables there. Like the host doesn't know this fact. So you're kind of calling him stupid already. <laughs> so he has a couple of choices. He can give like the snarky answer to this whole thing, or he can do the other. Well, he decides to pass on this, but I'll just share what's going on in his mind with you. Yes, there are empty tables there because they're reserved for people smart enough to make reservations. Not going to say that. We vent those things in our head. So he says, listen, it's not about the tables. We're short-staffed. And so a good restaurant won't book up a restaurant beyond its capacity or ability to serve you well. Plus, I know that the person who points out the empty tables is also the person that's going to give me a really bad review on Google if the service is slow. So we're not going to give you that table. Well, here's what she does next. And you shouldn't be that girl. I know the owner. So the host decides to get a little creative. He says, you know what? Let's have a little fun this evening. We have a table, perfect for you. There's five of them, perfect for you in our VIP section. But here's the thing, two drink minimum in there, so I'm gonna need to see your IDs. And I'm gonna hold on to them. Well, they don't think anything of it. She says, yeah, fine, that's great. Now on the way there, he's explaining. It's gonna be a little slow. Your food service is gonna be slow. We're low on staff, you understand? Yeah, 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 whatever. So she goes back there to the VIP area, and they go right past their two-drink minimum real quick, really, really fast. And of course, the service is slow, so they're not doing any defensive eating. So sooner or later, quickly, they get drunk. So they're all drunk in there, and now they're being rude to the servers and everything. And I'm sure you've seen this nowadays. If they're short on help, the host will start helping serving. The manager will come over and do things. So that's what's happening. The host jumps in. Now, this VIP area is one of these areas, and maybe you've been in them, where the menu doesn't have any prices. Well, that's interesting. If you find yourself at one of those in Naples, it's OK to ask how much things cost. But they don't. They don't care. So they're ordering caviar, oysters, lobster, everything. It's going crazy. Well, this continues on and on until they're ready to close. So the host says, hey, i got to settle the tab. Time to close up. Whatever. You know, so she gives him the credit card, practically throws it at him. He takes it. A few minutes goes by. He comes back and he says, discreetly, he's trying to be polite. 
ma'am, I'm sorry, but the card declined. What? That can't be. Now she wants to see the bill. So he brings the bill over. She opens it up, and her eyes just about pop out of her head. This bill is for $5,000. Are you kidding me? Now she wants to see the owner. Get me the owner. The host says, I am the owner. <laughs> and you're going to have to figure out how to pay for that because I have your driver's licenses. You're not going to dine and ditch, right? So he goes away, and the girl, she's looking at the bill, and she just starts crying into it, just crying, crying, crying. Her friends say, what's the matter? She says, well, that's my dad's credit card, and it has a $1,000 limit. So, by hanging out with this girl, it cost her friends $1,000 each for dinner. Today, we'll be talking about <laughs> listening what you, to what you want to hear <laughs> versus what you need to hear and the kind of associations you have or the company you keep. We find ourselves in the rest of the story. Last week, we looked at where Elijah and Ahab intersected. We saw the famous story about the contest on Mount Carmel, and I took it all the way to kind of the end of that thought. We're doing this in the series. I'm showing you guys sections of Scripture, not just like one chapter at a time, but wherever the application lands, you can see that the stories connect to one another for a very specific reason. God talks to us often in whispers. As great as that contest was in the fire from heaven, God teaches Elijah something. So we need to listen to when God whispers to us. So we're dealing with Israel in the north, and if you're new here and you don't understand, you can always go back and watch the messages, but if you don't want to do that, I'll explain it to you briefly. We're dealing with a split kingdom. You have Israel in the north, Judah in the south, so we're dealing mostly in the north. Today, they're going to intersect a little bit here. So I made you a chart. No, I did not draw that. Again, it would have bigger biceps if I drew it, <laughs> but, I did, but I did make you make the chart for you here so you can see. We've been talking about, now, here's a point. We're trying to do this somewhat chronologically, but you can't unless you want to melt your mind because if you do, sometimes even within one book of the Bible, it'll jump around a little bit. It'll go in and out of time, kind of like our movies do sometimes. They'll do a flashback to the past or something like that. So to attempt to put it together is extremely difficult. But we've seen that certain books of the Bible, it's made up of many books, they go in parallel detailing the same account. So that's what I'm putting in parallel for you so that you can see. But you'll see here, one account may detail other things that another doesn't. So that's why we're going to hop around today. So the chart, people have told me it's helpful. They say the cartoon looks like me. I do this with my arms all the time. So it's kind of funny. The artist picked up on that. We'll keep it, I guess, until someone complains about it. Then we'll keep it on purpose. So if you remember, <laughs> 1 Kings 15. If we go back and think, because like I said, we've deviated from that, gone into the Elijah thing for a little while, right? But we were talking about Asa, Abijah and Asa in 1 Kings 15. And you have this guy, Ben-Hadad, who is employed now. Because Israel and Judah are often at war here. So King Baasha, he's attacking. So Asa, instead of doing what he did in the beginning, instead of trusting the Lord, he employs this guy, Ben-Hadad. And that's not a great thing, king of Aram, instead of trusting the Lord. And now we're going to see that it causes other kings some problems. No bueno. And the chart, by the way... Um, you can download our app if you don't know about the app, C3 Naples. You can log into our Wi-Fi for free, and the chart should be in there. Bible study always follows the message, so we dig deeper on Wednesday nights. Um, but you can look at the questions anyway, even if you can't come. And if you're not going to come, well, maybe we need to make a new rule. If you're not going to come, you can't look at the questions. <laughs> so we left off where Elijah anoints Elisha. It's confusing for people, but Elijah, Elisha, he's his successor. If we turn the page, 1 Kings 20, starting at verse 1, about that time, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mobilized his army, supported by the chariots and horses of 32 
allied kings, major force here. They went to besiege Samaria, the capital of Israel, and launched attacks against it. Ben-Hadad sent messengers into the city to relay this message to King Ahab of Israel. This is what Ben-Hadad says, your silver and gold are mine, and so are your wives and the best of your children. All right, my lord the king, Israel's king replied, that's Ahab, all that I have is yours. <laughs> that was easy. So what do you think he does? Sends the messengers back. Okay, well, you know what? Now everything you have, I'm going to send people in there to check your homes. I'm going to take everything. Well, I guess that's just crossing the line. So his elders say, no, no, no. Give in to the first demand, but not the second demand. Well, ben Hadad, he gets angry. So the backdrop here is you have to picture he's in his tent, right? He's got all these military people around him, his advisors and stuff, and there's all the troops camped out there. And it says he's getting drunk in his tent. So he's a little rowdy, and he threatens Ahab now. He says, by the time I'm done with you, essentially, there won't even be enough dust in Samaria to give each one of your soldiers a handful. I'm going to pummel you. I'm taking everything. Ahab responds, a soldier putting his sword on, going out for war, shouldn't boast like a soldier who's already won. Well, now he's really mad. So there's a certain prophet that comes by to Ahab, this is the king of Israel, he says, this is what the Lord says, do you see these enemy forces? Today, I will hand them over to you, then you'll know that I'm the Lord. So Ahab's like, how? Well, 232 provincial field commanders and 7,000 men. He's going to send them out, but the Lord will hand you the victory, don't worry. Remember, Ben-Hadad, he's getting drunk with his officers. So scouts come in and they say, hey, this army's coming out to fight, but probably underestimates them. So they attack. The Lord hands them the victory, but Ben-Hadad escapes. Flashes to another conversation with Ben-Hadad's officers. You have two different conversations. So the officers are like, this is why we didn't win. Their gods, they're getting it wrong, are gods of the hills. Our gods are gods of the plains, essentially. So that's why. We'll draw them out onto the plains. We'll have the battle there, and we'll be successful. Just give us the same amount of troops again, and we'll go for it. We'll replace the kings with basically officers, real military people, and he'll hand us the victory. Now, flash to Ahab's camp. The man of God says to him, get ready. Don't just rest on your laurels. Now, get ready, because they're going to come back in the spring. I'll hand you the victory again. Then you'll know I'm the Lord. So that's what happens at a place called Aphek. And just to make it shorter, they're camped out for seven days, right? So they're getting ready for the battle. And it says that Israel's troops look like a couple of little flocks of goats, two little flocks of goats compared to like this huge army that's against them. So they attack after seven days, Israel, that is. And they kill 100,000 men. They retreat, Ben-Hadad and his guys, into Aphek. A wall falls on them, it says, killing 27,000 more men. So here's what Ben-Hadad's people say. They're like, well, I heard that the kings of Israel are merciful, so we'll go and surrender. So they put on like burlap or sackcloth and ropes around their head. I don't even know what that's all about. But they go and they surrender. And it's Kind of interesting, because when the messengers go to surrender, you know, it talks about Ben-Hadad, and Ahab says, oh, Ben-Hadad, he's still alive? He's my brother. And they pick up on it. They say, oh, yeah, 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 he's your brother. That's great. Can we surrender? And he ends up making terms with him. It says he invites him up into his chariot. Right? So he makes good terms with him, which is kind of crazy. Then it flashes to a different scene. It's kind of funny. There's a prophet among his kinsmen or men around him. He walks up to one of the other men and he says, hit me. So the guy doesn't. No. Because you didn't obey a command from the Lord, a lion will come out and kill you. And it does. <laughs> it's very quick, kind of weird. So he goes up to another prophet and goes, hit me. Well, that guy's like, sure, <laughs> I don't want to get killed by a lion. Hits him. Says it wounds him badly and he bandages himself up. Well, Prophets often do illustrations. So what he does is he waits on the side of the road for Ahab to come by. And when he does, he makes up a story. He says, I was in the midst of the battle. And here's what happened. I was given a prisoner to watch after and told that if I don't guard this prisoner, if I lose him, I'm going to die or have to pay 75 pounds of silver. One talent. We've talked about that in the series. So your Bible might say 75 pounds. It might say one talent. 
but I lost him. Well, Ahab jumps on it and says, well, that's your fault. The prophet then takes off the bandage. Ahab sees this is a prophet of the Lord. He says, this is what the Lord says. Because you have spared the man, I said must be destroyed. Now you must die in his place and your people will die instead of his people. So the king, it says, went home angry and sullen. The Bible says sullen. It's kind of a cool word. <laughs> so if we turn the page, we get another account. 1 Kings 21.1. Now there was a man named Naboth from Jezreel who owned a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab in Samaria. One day, Ahab said to Naboth, since your vineyard is so convenient to my palace, I would like to buy it to use as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I'll pay you for it. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall and refused to eat. <laughs> Howdy guy. He didn't like what he wanted. He didn't get what he wanted to hear. He didn't like what he heard there. So Jezebel, his wife, what's the matter? He explains what the matter is. She's like, don't worry about it. Remember Jezebel, the wicked queen? I, I'll, get you, I'll get you the vineyard. So here's what she does. She calls for a time of fasting and prayer. Not feasting, fasting and prayer. And she sends messengers out, invites everybody. She invites Naboth. Gives him the place of honor. She also invites two scoundrels, it says, who are supposed to sit across from him and accuse him of something. And so they do. They say, this man cursed God and the king. And so they take him out and stone Naboth to death. He dies. Jezebel comes back. Remember that vineyard you wanted? I got it for you at a great price. So Ahab is happy. Now, Elijah enters back into the account. 1 Kings 21, 17. But the Lord said to Elijah, go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel, claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? Because you have done this, dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they licked the blood of Naboth. He also goes on to say that he's going to destroy his dynasty at that point in his lifetime. Jezebel, too. Dogs will lick her blood. Horrible prophecy for them. So now Ahab has like this brief time of repentance. He's sorry for a little while. He does what Ben-Hadad's messengers do. And so then another message came from the Lord to Elijah. Do you see how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. It will happen to his sons. I will destroy his dynasty. But the blood still there. So if we hop to 2 Chronicles, we get more information. Remember, they're running in parable, so parallel. So meanwhile, in the south, we have Jehoshaphat. So this is Asa's son. So we kind of jump five chapters here. 2 Chronicles 17.1, then Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, became the next king. This is of Judah. He strengthened Judah to stand against any attack from Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified towns of Judah, and he assigned additional garrisons to the land of Judah and to the towns of Ephraim that his brother Asa had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father's early years and did not worship the images of Baal. He sought his father's God and obeyed his commands instead of following the evil practices of the kingdom of Israel. Israel. I will summarize this for you. He mostly gets rid of the idol worship that we've been talking about. He sends officials out to teach all the people the law, and then we get a summary of hundreds of thousands of troops that he has. So what we have going on here is the north and the south. We can click the chart back up, and we'll see where now they're going to intersect again here. So we have Jehoshaphat making an alliance with Ahab. So the north and the south, they're going to come together. Second Chronicles 18.1, we're staying there because it gives us a little more information. Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem, and he made an alliance with Ahab of Israel by having his son marry Ahab's daughter. A few years later, he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep, goats, and cattle for the feast. Then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to recover Ramath-Gilead. Will you go with me to Ramath-Gilead? King Ahab of Israel asked King Jehoshaphat of Judah. 
He says, of course. My troops are your troops. My horses are your horses. We are as one. Then he says, shouldn't we see what the Lord says about this? Well, remember the contest on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal. They had 400 prophets of Asherah, but they kind of disappeared off the scene. We didn't hear about them. So Ahab has these 400 prophets. These are probably those prophets, and they're prophesying before him. And they're saying, yeah, you're going to win. Go out. You're going to have victory. Jehoshaphat probably knows they're false prophets, so he says, isn't there a prophet of the Lord here that we can consult with. Ahab goes, there's one. His name is Micaiah, and he never has anything good to say about me. Jehoshaphat says, that's no way a king should talk. Go get him. So they send messengers to go get him. In the meantime, it says they're sitting on their thrones and their royal robes, and these prophets are prophesying. There's a guy named Zedekiah, and he made these iron horns, and he's saying, in this way, you'll gore the Arameans. Go out to fight. Meanwhile, the messenger's getting Micaiah, and he says, listen, they're saying that they're going to win. This is good stuff. Just go along with it. I can't do that. I'm only going to prophesy what the Lord says. But... <laughs> When he gets there, he's really sarcastic. Ahab asked him, what's going to happen? What does the Lord say? Oh, of course, go out and you'll have victory. And then Ahab yells at him, didn't I tell you when you prophesy, only say what the Lord says? Okay, I'll give you the real prophecy. He says, in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat. Didn't I tell you he never has anything good to say about me? So then Micaiah continues. He tells a story of a lying spirit. He said, I saw God in his throne room in the heavens with all the armies of heaven at his right and at his left. And he's saying, how or who can I go out and entice Ahab to go to Ramoth Gilead and get himself killed? One spirit, after some deliberation, lots of people have answers, but one spirit came up to him and said, I can do it. God says, how will you do it? He goes, ah, I'll convince him. I'll put a lying spirit into his prophets to tell him to go out and get killed. Now, Zedekiah, the guy with the horns, comes up to Micah and slaps him. Since when has the spirit of the Lord left me to go to you? You'll find out when you're hiding out in some room somewhere. And so he goes away. Mark my words. He's taken away into jail, given only bread and water while he waits there. Second Chronicles 18.28 says, So King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, As we go into battle, I'll disguise myself so no one will recognize me. But you wear your royal robes. <laughs> So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Meanwhile, Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, had issued these orders, attack only the king of Israel, nobody else. So they're in the battle, and Jehoshaphat, he's dressed like a king, and he's trying to get away, but he cries out. They realize it's not who they're looking for. They're looking for King Ahab, so they leave him alone. And the story's a little strange. It says that an Aramean archer randomly shoots an arrow in the air, and it finds a spot between Ahab's armor, the space in his armor, and kills him. But before he dies, I'm wounded, so his charioteer takes him away. And there's a scene where he's propped up in the chariot, arrows in him, he's bleeding out, but he's watching the battle. And then he dies. Then it says, when they take the chariot away to clean it, you have to jump back to 1 Kings to get this part, that when they're cleaning the chariot, dogs came and licked up his blood thereby fulfilling the prophecy. Summarize the next couple chapters for you, and we'll get to the application. 2 Chronicles 19, when King Jehoshaphat of Judah arrived safely home in Jerusalem, Jehu, son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. Why should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? He asked the king. Because of what you've done, the Lord is very angry with you. Even so, there is some good in you. For have you, removed, you have removed the Asherah poles throughout the land, and you have committed yourself to seeking God. You should not have made that alliance. Micaiah was right. So when we are in friendship with the wicked, 
We are bound in their sins. So he does some reforms. He appoints Levites, tells them, judge cases fairly. If we turn the page, just overview a lot of this. What happens is the Moabites, the Ammonites, all these forces come against Jehoshaphat now. And it says he's terrified. He's so scared that he prays out loud. He orders everyone to fast. And so what happens is the Spirit of the Lord comes upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel. He's a Levite, descendant of Asaph. Asaph also wrote a lot of the Psalms, like David. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is, is not yours, but God's. <laughs> Actually, hard to say. So it's not yours. It's God's. God is going to win this battle for you. So Jehoshaphat encourages everyone again. They have singers out in front of them as they march ahead. And they're pre-proclaiming this victory. A, a common thing, Psalm 137, 36, 7, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. That refrain is give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. So that's the refrain after every single verse in that psalm. So what happens is the enemy ends up just fighting against one another. They all kill one another. And it says there's so much plunder left over it takes them three days to pick it all up. So they name the place the Valley of Blessing. For the faithful, every spiritual battle has already been won by God. A summary of Jehoshaphat's reign, then we'll move on. 2 Chronicles 20, 32. Jehoshaphat was a good king following the ways of his father Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. During his reign, however, he failed to remove all the pagan shrines, and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the God of their ancestors. The rest of the events in Jehoshaphat's reign from beginning to end are recorded in the record of Jehu, son of Hanani, which is included in the book of the kings of Israel. Some time later, King Jehoshaphat of Judah made an alliance with King Ahaziah of Israel, who was very wicked. Together, they built a fleet of trading ships at the port of Ezon Geber. Then, Eliezer, son of Dodavihu from Merisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat. He said, Because you have allied yourself with King Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy your work. So the ships met with disaster and never put out to sea. I got Dodavihu right, but almost messed up alliance. How did I do that? <laughs> We've talked about not letting our affiliations compromise our Christianity throughout this series. And this includes our personal relationships with people. Sometimes the wrong association will cause us to compromise our beliefs, our morals, what we know is right. Both Jehoshaphat and Ahab do this. Ben-Hadad, he's the result of a bad association. And then again, it affects Israel. We'll see it's going to cause more problems down the line. Ahab married Jezebel. This leads to this worship of Baal and Asherah, all this bad stuff. It affects Israel. Ahab foolishly befriends. Ben hey, Dad, come on up in my chariot. We're brothers. That association, again, will have more consequences. Ahab's association with Jezebel continues to cause problems with Naboth. Now, this is why the dogs are going to lick up their blood. No good. Jehoshaphat almost gets himself killed by his association with Ahab. Jehoshaphat learns his lesson. He reassociates with the Lord, but then what does he do? He makes an alliance with Ahaziah, that's Ahab's son. We saw the evil association of prophets, the deceitful spirit versus Micaiah. So in this section, we see an overlying theme, bad associations and ignoring warnings from people who have really good advice. Just because you might not like what you hear, what they're saying. Ahab didn't like what Naboth said. So Jezreel gave, or Jezebel gave him what he wanted, not what he needed. Micaiah, he tells Ahab exactly what he needs to hear. But the Spirit prompts the prophets to tell him what he wants 
to hear. We learn that in life, our real friends don't always tell us what we want to hear. Our real friends tell us what we need to hear. Oftentimes, just as in these accounts, when we surround us with yes people, we surround ourselves with people just telling us what we want to hear all the time, it gets us into trouble. <laughs> I may get myself into trouble today. Have you ever asked someone this question? Do you think I need to lose some weight? Sounds like a trick question, like, how do I answer that? A real friend knows exactly how to answer that. If you do need to lose weight, some of you do not. But if you do, if that would be good for your health, maybe help you get a girlfriend, I don't know. Your real friends are going to say, yeah, you need to lose some weight. That's a real friend. Now, <laughs> here's where I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> It may surprise you to find out that I told my wife she needed to lose weight. But if you know me, that probably doesn't surprise you at all. <laughs> You're all like, totally still, don't look at Heather, don't look at Heather. <laughs> now, it may surprise you even more that this was before we got married, and this was before we even got engaged. Why then did she marry you? <laughs> Now, you might think, what was her response, right? Did you get slapped like Micaiah <laughs> or, or the prophet with the bandage, right? Because you'd be right in thinking that. Because if you look at the interlinear lexicon of English translation to female, and you look up <laughs> why you need to lose weight, if you look up that sentence, it says... Hit me! That's what it says. That's the, that's the translation, right? So you'd be right to think that. Hit me! She didn't. Here's the thing. She was surrounding herself, and not by her own fault, but she had people around her who weren't her friends. They were happy that she could just stay the way she was. Right? Maybe they want to make themselves look better. And so they just told her maybe what she wanted to hear. You look fine. You don't need to lose any weight. You're good. So they kept telling her over and over again. But behind her back, they were happy to make fun of her. I knew this was going on, so I told her the truth. You asked. Yeah. Yes, you need to lose some weight. She didn't hear. Hit me. <laughs> she can speak English. It was interesting. You know what her response was overall? And this is a few conversations. I'm shortening it. But the general sentiment was this. Finally, someone who cares enough about me to tell the truth. Huge. No one, I have a mirror, she once said. I know. It's almost like a test. You want to find out who your friends are. Ask them a question like that. I loved her. I had her best interests in mind. Proverbs 29.5, to flatter friends is to lay a trap for their feet. You see, there's what you want to hear, and then there's what you need to hear. Jehoshaphat seemed to know this when he appointed the judges. If we go into that section, I overviewed it for you, but if we look at some specifics, 2 Chronicles 19.5. He appointed judges throughout the nation in all the fortified towns, and he said to them, always think carefully before pronouncing judgment. Remember that you do not judge to please people, but to please the Lord. He will be with you when you render the verdict in each case. <laughs> Yet there are some associations that consider themselves judgment-free zones. I couldn't be any more pointed. I've talked about this in the past, about gyms. We related it to Christianity, the way a lot of people want to do Christianity. They want to check the box, right? So I want to go to the gym, eat a box of donuts before I go, but just hop on the treadmill for 30 minutes and say I work out. 
I get the little thing for my keychain. Yes, I go to the gym. And everyone looking at you says, no, you do not. Or what are you doing there, right? And we talked about judgment-free zones. We talked about good gyms. You want to go to a good gym, the trainer is going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you what you need to hear, right? They want to get you in shape. The bad gyms, no, 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 no. They just want to keep making you happy. People pleasers tell you whatever you want. Oh, you're doing great. You smell like donuts and alcohol, but whatever. You know what I mean? Just keep giving us your money. <laughs> you laughed. That was funny. <laughs> we seem to understand this, telling people what we need to hear. We understand this. We understand this in sports culture. You might get, see someone like get sacked today, a quarterback. He's not going to be like, that's cool, guys. We're good. No. What, are you trying to get me killed? He's going to start yelling at the other player. The coach, he's going to do a lot of yelling. He's like very frustrated, like they're on the verge of a heart attack. They're telling the players what they need to hear. If they don't do good enough, get on the bench. I'll send someone in who could do the job. We understand that, sports culture. We understand that. I told you, I came from a martial arts background. It's not, you don't coach people nicely, you know what I mean? You're going to get knocked out. Keep your hands up, you know? It's not like, oh, and that's cool. We're going to do all right. No, especially professional fighters. You're going to lose a lot of money, your career. We understand this with our worldly affiliations, whether it be sports, martial arts, different things like that, coaching, that culture. We understand that in sports, fitness, martial arts, we understand that this is a part of the culture of the clubs we join. We get it. So the question is, why don't we get it in Christianity? I've been told this before. You want to fill up the church, Gene? Start telling everybody what they want to hear. Fill in nice and quick. Guess that's why. Now, here's the thing, a little note. <laughs> and this is kind of an important one. If you've been in church for a while, you'll know this, and I know where the laughs are going to come from. By culture, I don't mean the way we dress. I don't mean that stuff, right? So by culture, I'm not talking about the skinny jeans. We need to wear those now. And the man bun, thank goodness that's gone, right? And beard, especially like if we're Calvinists, we need to have the beard and the fedora, right? Those two things are extremely important. <laughs> I knew you were going to laugh. <laughs> Got to grow a beard, right? I'm not a Calvinist if you don't have a beard. I'm not talking about that, right? I've, I've been in churches like this. I've led worship in churches like this. <laughs> the rehearsal, I wore shorts and sandals. I don't dress like this all the time. It's very uncomfortable. The clothes are tight. <laughs> I'm comfortable. I go to the rehearsal. They freak out. You're not going to wear that on Sunday, are you? Can't do that. And by the way, you can only wear gray, white, or black. You can't wear that blue shirt that matches your eyes, you know? What? Yes, that's a very real conversation. You got to be one of the cool kids if you want to be on stage. Ooh, and it really helps if you wear a scarf inside. That's important, right? Because it might get cold. I'm not talking about that. And in fact, to the younger people out there doing that, you know what that is? That's the new suit and tie. That's the new big hat. I knew a church lady, traditional church, had a room full of hats. Because that's important, the way you dress. You can't come here unless you've got your suit and tie on because we're from the world, so you got to look like the world. So to the kids doing that, that is just the new suit and tie. It's just the fancy dress. It's just the stained glass. That's all that is. People are going to look back at that in 40, 30, 50 years. It's not going to be cool anymore. No good. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way we live. I'm talking about a lifestyle. Actually, getting rid of all that stuff and making people the greatest importance. And if people are important to us, we'll tell them the truth. Church culture, it can be helpful if it's done biblically in much the same way. So in church, it's called discipleship. That's what it's called, discipleship. And you know all about it in sports, but we just have to change the words a little. So I'll just use the regular words. You have coaches, trainers in sports. That's me. That's leadership. People are going to tell you what you need to hear. It's not always going to be nice. I'm trying to be patient. Yes, we'll read how the Bible says that, but at the same time, you may not like it. 
but I'm your real friend. I'm telling you what you need to hear. And that's what coaches do. I'm like a coach. That's what I do. Then you have training partners or teammates. Those are the people sitting next to you. You're a team. Team Jesus. Those are your teammates. So you train with one another. And if you've ever done martial arts, good martial art, right? You go back and forth. You're trying iron sharpens iron, another proverb. You're trying to make each other better. And so this is doing life with one another, Christianese for training partners, teammates, right? And so you may have noticed, we don't have a lot of those small groups that are really big groups where people get lost. Someone takes over. They think they're a pastor. They're not. It all falls apart. A bunch of people leave your church. Done with that. Biblical discipleship, Paul's not writing a Timothy to make sure you've got, you know, at least five small groups so everybody joins your church, all right? You got to do a certain thing, certain way. No. Separate out the youth from this and that and the women and the men. And the... Nope. You're not going to find that in there. They do church as a family. It's a family. Everybody does it together. The young people learn and are brought up from the old people because they have wisdom and knowledge, I hope. So it's a family. We are a family. We're a team. We do it together. And when we do our one-on-one, -on -one, we buddy up. It's far more likely that someone is going to open up about what they're going through in a one-on-one -on -one setting at lunch or something like that. Do life together. Get to know one another. Make a friend. If you don't have one, I'll be your friend. But you probably won't like lunch with me because I'll tell you what you don't want to hear. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> yeah, that's the beginning of all my counseling sessions. Right? Do you want me to ask you a bunch of questions you already know the answer to? Or do you want me to just rip the Band-Aid off because I don't get paid by the hour? That's modern counseling. Right? Do it nice and slow. Nope. That's what you need to hear. Let's go. Move on. Get out of my office. <laughs> the buddy system. We can be honest. We're supposed to do that. I described this maybe a couple weeks ago. Right? Paul had his Timothy bringing him up. Paul also had a Barnabas accountability. They argued a little bit over Mark. <laughs> but anyway, you see? Call them out. Do life together. What does Jesus do? He sends them in pairs. Right? They go out in pairs. It's Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Silas, traveling companions. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's family, right? You have the older people bringing you up, vice versa. And then you always have like your favorite family member, uncle, something like that, or favorite cousin that you play with. That's what the Bible says. That's how it works. That's biblical church. But unfortunately, in many churches, they're just telling people what they want to hear. People pleasing. It fills seats. But that's not at all what real church is supposed to look like. This is biblical church. When someone's way off, you need to tell them. you got to bring them back in. Paul, for example, he writes to the churches in Galatia where they're falling for false teachings. So he says anyone who believes in a different gospel, there isn't another gospel, who falls for these teachings, they're cursed. He'll go on to call them fools. There's no problem saying that. Don't worry. There's no problem saying that. Fools. And in the midst of it, he says this, Galatians 1.10. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. Think about those words. If pleasing people were my goal, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. That's what it says in the Greek. Clearly, Paul's not a people pleaser. And he tells others, Philippians, for example, I'm trying to be like Jesus. Timothy's trying to be like Jesus. Epaphroditus, is tr they're trying to be like Jesus. Right? So be like Jesus. Be like us. No people pleasing. They should use them as an example, and so should leaders today. We are to be faithful to the word. That's my job. That's it. Faithful to the word. If that steps on your toes, it's between you and the Lord, not me. This is what Paul tells his student, Timothy. 2 Timothy 4.1, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. 
patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news, the gospel, and faithfully carry out the ministry God has given you. That's my job. That's it. As we conclude today, let's pray from the word of the Lord. Join Paul in his sentiments, that hard letter to the church in Galatia. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Amen. Thank you.